A very good day to all those viewing this presentation. Today, we will be delving into the topic of carbon capture and sequestration, that is CCS. Uh, more specifically, we will be talking about the role of microalgae and cyanobacteria in CCS. Uh, now, to start us off, you must be wondering, what exactly is CCS? Well, as most of you are well aware, our planet has begun showing some major signs of global warming and climate change. So one of the main ways of tackling this problem uh, would be to simply stop using fossil fuels and coal. Because as we know, it is the burning of fossil fuels and coals that contributes most to such issues. Um, however, the thing is, is that most developing countries, including India itself, are heavily dependent on such coal and power, um, fossil fuel industries for their economic growth. Um, not just this, most of these power plants have a well-existing infrastructure in place along with working. So making a sudden switch to a completely different alternate source would not be very um, practical or even financially feasible for any country. So the question that arises is, what can we do now? Well, another recent area of research has been to capture the carbon that exists in the atmosphere from CO2 and store it in such a way that it cannot return back to the atmosphere. By this logic, we'd simply be decreasing or offsetting all the carbon emissions that are currently taking place. Um, given the scenario of the world, CCS currently is the best possible solution to this issue. Now, there are multiple techniques involved in CCS, and one of the most common ones is to use organisms such as microalgae and cyanobacteria to aid the process. After all, these organisms are naturally green, meaning that they have a natural tendency to utilize carbon dioxide in generating their own energy, in a process that we all more commonly know it as photosynthesis. So, um, organisms such as marine microscopic algae, or in other words, phytoplanktons, are both aquatic and autotrophic in nature, making them ideal for this study. In fact, research has even shown that uh, phytoplanktons are responsible for nearly 50% of the total assimilation of atmospheric carbon dioxide. So such organisms can mainly store carbon in one of two ways, either directly as CO2 or in the form of bicarbonates. Such storage is done via three main mechanisms. The first is phototrophic in nature, um, so this is the most common one and uh, the Kelvin cycle is generally followed uh, which involves an enzyme known as ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate oxygenase or carboxylase. I know the name is quite a mouthful so it's more commonly known as Rubisco. This enzyme Rubisco is capable of converting um, the carbon dioxide into phosphoglycerides thereby reducing its content from the atmosphere in algal cells when it is present in algal cells. Um, the second mechanism is heterotrophic in nature and an added advantage of this is that the organisms that follow this mechanism do not require a light source and can also utilize inorganic sources of carbon. This mechanism actually developed as more of an adaptive strategy by organisms that grew in dark or dimly lit environments with a lack of normal food resources. The final one is mixotrophic in nature and as the name suggests, it's a mixture of both autotrophic and heterotrophic which essentially means that plants that employ this mechanism can use both organic and inorganic sources of carbon, both in the presence or absence of light. Now, out of all of these, it is very obvious that mixotrophic is the most preferred way. Um, the th thing is, um, uh, most organisms employ the photosynthetic phototrophic route. This, as we mentioned, involves the Kelvin-Benson cycle and an enzyme Rubisco. But the thing with Rubisco is that it has both oxygenase and carboxylase activity, which means it can react with both oxygen and carbon dioxide. Um, in fact, it has a much higher affinity for oxygen than carbon dioxide. This would mean that if the, both the gases are present surrounding an algal cell, the enzyme Rubisco would much rather bind to oxygen than carbon dioxide. Um, in addition to this, in most water bodies, the amount of dissolved carbon dioxide is much, much lesser than that of the dissolved oxygen. Hence, in order to combat this issue of a lesser substrate being available to them and their enzyme selectivity, these algal cells have developed certain adaptive me mechanisms, which in other words are known as carbon concentration mechanisms or CCMs. Such concentration mechanisms are actually extremely helpful in CCS. Um, because even logically thinking, if I can concentrate something in one place, it is so much easier to capture and store it elsewhere. Um, so uh, there are three main types of such strategies or pathways. 
The first one is the C4 or CAM pathway. Now this is a dual phase pathway. What generally happens is during the dark phase or at night, CO2 is absorbed by the plant and is converted into an organic acid, most commonly malic acid, which by the way is a four carbon compound, hence the name C4. Then back during the light phase or during daytime, at a later stage, these organic acids are decarboxylated back to CO2. So a large amount of CO2 develops inside the cell and therefore Rubisco has a much higher chance of binding with CO2 rather than O2. Um, the second mechanism is also similar, only that it involves conversion into inorganic forms, which is bicarbonates. So carbon dioxide is converted to bicarbonates in these cells and is pumped inside into a micro compartment, which is known as a carboxysome. This carboxysome in itself is a storehouse of two enzymes, Rubisco and carbonic anhydrase. Now we know how Rubisco works, but carbonic anhydrase can convert bicarbonates back to carbon dioxide. So to run us through, carbon dioxide is taken in, converted to bicarbonates, stored in a carboxysome, where carbonic anhydrase acts on it, converts it back to CO2. Now, Rubisco is, is surrounded by a large amount of CO2, thereby increasing its efficiency. The third mechanism is also similar. In this case, a light and pH-based gradient is used in order to um, surround the enzyme Rubisco with carbon dioxide, once again increasing its efficiency and enhancing the utilization of CO2. Um, so currently, a microalgae and cyanobacteria both are being used at a global level on a very large scale in three main ways. The first is by using bioreactors. These are essentially um, large-scale algal cultures that are being grown in vessels in the presence of light with flue gas being used as a substrate for carbon. Now, flue gas is a common term which is used to denote all the exhaust gases that exit any power plant. So when that is provided to algae as a substrate, they will grow in size and will sequester the carbon. But the issue is that this photobioreactor is affected by a lot of factors such as the temperature, the pH, the strain of the microalgal culture used, the type of bioreactor used, um, in case of any invading species being present, etc, etc. But one positive aspect of this is that a large amount of algal biomass tends to get accumulated, which takes us to our second method, which is biorefineries. Biorefineries are basically agents that can, uh, machinery wherein um, algal biomass is provided as substrate to convert it into biogases or biofuels, which are more greener and cleaner sources of energy. So the most important biogas is probably biodiesel, but others include bioethanol, biobutanol, and biomethanol. Um, in fact, as I had mentioned before, it is not possible to make a sudden switch to green sources. However, with this, you can make a more gradual transition to using altogether cleaner sources of energy only. The last one of the mechanisms is where cyanobacteria comes in. Now, cyanobacteria comprise of an a community of organisms uh, which have an illustrious history of fossils. This is because of the physiological tendency of the organism to um, sort of form a calcium carbonate biofilm or to calcify. So uh, it uses uh, carbon dioxide along with intracellular carbon as a protective mechanism to form a thick shell surrounding itself. In other words, carbonate deposits. By this uh, method, it is extremely easy to sequester carbon geologically, that is, in the form of a rock. Um, now we come to our last slide, which involves future prospects and conclusion. So um, currently, scientists are mostly looking at biotechnology, or more importantly, re uh, recombinant DNA technology, as a way to create genetically modified algal organisms that are capable of withstanding many biotic and abiotic stresses, and offer advantages such as temperature and pH resistance, higher growth rates, stress tolerance, and protection against invading species, etc., etc. In conclusion, it is the need of the R to ensure that um, climate change and global warming is tackled. And while it is not easy for us to make a sudden switch to green uh, fuels, we can limit the current rates of usage of carbon dioxide and offset them. Um, this would ensure that in current, the current rates and future rates are reduced and if this mechanism picks up, then we can even tackle all the past damage that has been done. Thank you very much. This brings us to the end of our presentation. I hope it was informative for you.